many people here this morning are glad that we live in a world that embraces biblical truth and encourages God-ordained righteousness? Are you glad that we can live in freedom without any threat, harm, or maliciousness from those in the world who don't believe in God? Okay, never mind. I'm being facetious. <laughs> that isn't true at all. We live in a world that is openly, openly defiant of God and his righteousness. A world that is doing all they can to hinder our walk with our Lord Jesus. It isn't to live... It isn't easy to live our faith day in and day out. In fact, laws are being written to directly interfere with our life of faith and to threaten us. And and if you do certain things, they're threatening to put you in jail. Not like you murdered somebody or anything, but that's what they're threatening you to do. The truth is that the first century church was involved in a battle that has not yet ended means the church is still involved in that same battle that they were 2,000 years ago. Paul prepared the church in his day to be prepared for this ongoing battle, and he gave them some specifics to help those Christians not only to prepare for the battle, but to be successful in the battle, standing at the end, victorious in Jesus Christ. In doing so, he has also given us the same things that we need to be prepared for the battle and to equip us in order that you and I are successful in that same battle. The same warfare is still being raged against the church by the same foe. And success is still accomplished by using the same power, the same weapons, and all of the same tools that they used in the first century. Napoleon Bonaparte and his men were entering into a new battle, and he had heard some rumblings of discontent among his men. And they weren't really focused like he wanted them to be focused on the battle. And as they were about to engage in the the battle, Napoleon ordered his men to light their ships on fire. This was to ensure that his men kept focus on moving forward in battle and giving it their all. There was no hope of life in retreating. It is said he told his men that if they wanted to return home alive, they would need to do it in their enemy's ships. He understood that you cannot win a battle looking backwards and trying to be safe. Napoleon Bonaparte For him, there was not a plan B, victory or defeat, and that's the way it went. That is the nature of our battle. If you enlist in the army of God and you engage in this battle, your only assurance of victory is living, of living, is moving forward in the battle and coming out victorious in Christ. Retreat most always means loss and death. When it comes to the battle that we as Christians are engaged in, the same principle is true. We should never look back. We should always keep our focus on moving forward and marching on to victory. That's what Paul said he was doing. I realize the battle is somewhat different today than it, than the battles that... that um, in a normal or in a physical war happen. Our battle isn't really physical, I understand that. Our battle is spiritual. The battle is for your soul, yours and my soul, and it is with the mind, the battle, a lot of it. And so we we need to engage in this and never retreat. A little incentive is that we have we know that if we stick with it in Christ, we are already victorious. So in Ephesians 6, Paul writes to the Christians of his day, and ultimately it holds the same truth for us today, reminding them of the cosmic narrative in which the church holds an essential role and the preparation we need and the armor we need to fight this battle. Paul begins our passage in Ephesians 6.10, by saying, finally, 
This means as a culmination of the last two and a half chapters that I've written to you, or the last two and a half pages, however it was in that time, he said, finally, this is the battle that we must recognize and be prepared for, and that we have entered with our Lord Jesus Christ. We are in a battle of epic proportions. We are not going to be victorious in this battle with our wisdom and our strength. So finally, be strong in the Lord and stand in the strength of his might. You know, it's interesting. Bluto, I don't know if you even know who Bluto is, but was always trying to take Popeye's girl, Oli, from him. And Popeye would fight for his girl, and he'd be getting beat down by Bluto until he busted out his can of spinach. And his muscles popped, and he laid a beat down on Bluto. Jesus is our spinach. He's our strength in the battle that we're fighting each and every day. With him, we can give the devil a beatdown. And we can be victorious. But without Jesus, we will fail miserably against that enemy. Jesus is the one that is undefeated and will remain that way. The only way that we can be undefeated is if we stand in his might and his strength and fight this battle. Just like David did with Goliath. We talked about that this morning. David's faith was that God would take him down and he did. Then we must also realize the type of battle that we're involved in. The battle that we're engaged in is a spiritual battle. It is a battle for your heart and your soul. It is a battle between God and those who want you to live, don't want you to live in harmony with him for all eternity, but want to destroy your soul. Though the battle is spiritual and it happens in the heavenly realms, our role here on earth is vital. When we live in faithful obedience to Christ, we affect that battle in a positive way. And then, of course, when we, we can affect it in a negative way if we do the opposite, if we don't live by faith in Christ. And so we're, in essence, then we are giving our soul over to the devil. That is why Paul says, put on the whole armor of God so as to enable you to stand against the schemes of the devil, our adversary. Stand f to stand firm is a military term, meaning that a soldier holds his or her position and doesn't allow the enemy to overrun them. That's what it means to stand firm. The devil's schemes are meant to defeat you and to tear you down. It's kind of like, I don't know if you get those telephone calls every once in a while and, and they're scheming and they want to get your money from you. That's how the devil works. He, but his goal is not your money. His goal is your soul, your eternal soul. Understand this. I want you to think about this. As Paul is writing this letter, you need to understand that he is chained to a Roman soldier. Literally, he's tethered to a Roman soldier while he's writing this letter. He does it by the strength of Jesus, and he's encouraging all of his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to do the same. So now let's take a little a look at our opponent, our enemy. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. We're facing this enemy that is in a spiritual battle. But we will only have great success when we actually know who the enemy truly is that we are fighting. Too often, as soldiers of Christ, we can spend far too much time fighting the wrong opponent. If we are not careful, if we don't know our enemy. Knowing the enemy that we are facing helps us to understand him and, and not take the battle too lightly. Because the battle is spiritual, because it is for each person's soul, we are not fighting the person per se. We are fighting the influences on that person that is opposing us, that is challenging us. And that, and that is the battle that we're engaged in. So 
Our battle isn't to take down the person that's in front of us. It's to enlighten them on the destruction of their soul that's happening and that it doesn't have to be that way because our fight is with the devil. The politicians, the powers that be, the authorities of the nations around the world, they may be influenced by the devil and they may give themselves over to the devil's influence in his schemes. But we are not personally fighting those people. We are fighting the devil and his influence on those people. Those people are all just pawns in his game plan. God has angels in the spiritual realm, as does the devil. And that is the battleground. What we do here helps out on one side of that battle or the other side of that battle, depending on whom we're devoted to. Love the sinner. Hate the sin. The people are not the enemy. The devil's the enemy. And, he, and his influences on those people is the enemy. So rather than fighting the pawns, Fight the devil by converting the pawns to Christ. That's the battle. I watched a movie on the American Revolution and how the mighty British army lost that war. No one, if they were taking bets on that war, would have bet for the, for the ragtag American army because the British were the powerhouse of the day. But they had completely underestimated their opponent. They believed in a matter of days they would overrun the, and annihilate the, the militia of the American army without even putting much effort into the battle. It was going to be a fun sport for them. Three years later, they lost the battle. And they lost it in a big way. Now, I realize the French came and helped out the Americans. I, I realize that. But the British... Um, just underestimated who they were, and they lost. The reason the Americans won is they knew their enemy, and they knew their strategies, and they didn't underestimate them, and they countered with the right things. They countered their strategies with the right things to defeat them, things the British were unfamiliar with and not prepared for. They had a strong unity, purpose, and goal. Their freedom from slavery to British rule. Now, our opponent in this battle that we're in wants to enslave us in, their sin, in his sinful ways. And so every time he comes knocking, we need to be prepared. We need to have the right things to resist our enemy and to stand firm in the strength of our Lord. And with the Lord, we will defeat our enemy every time. So having the proper and necessary protection when you're involved in a battle is very important. Without proper protection, you are left vulnerable. You're left open to harm by the weapons of the enemy. God in his wonderful foresight and his foreknowledge of this enemy, he, and he knows just how vulnerable we can be. He's provided us with the armor we need to protect us and to help us to gain victory over that enemy. Paul already told us in Ephesians 6 and 11 saying, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Well, through the ages, so many weapons in this world have been invented. Do you realize that um, every time they invent a weapon, they're also busy inventing a safeguard against that weapon. That's how it goes. That's how things go. And so one person invents a weapon, another person invents something to protect you from that weapon. Being that we're in a spiritual war battle, our armor looks different than the physical armor of the physical battle. A man said he was shot at and he had a Bible in his pocket and the Bible stopped the bullet. That's not what I'm talking about. That's great that it did that, but that's not what I'm talking about. We're talking about faith 
and God's word and his righteousness and the truth of the gospel and God's spirit and salvation and prayer. That's what we're talking about. And Paul says in Ephesians 6 and 13, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. This armor is incredible that God has given us. It's a, a one-fits-all size. It works for everyone exactly the same, and it fits everyone's life exactly the same. And it comes with a guarantee of victory. It's God's fashion armor that works perfectly in this battle that we're involved in and is most effective to defeat the devil. We hear people sometimes who say, well, do this, or I'm going to do that when people are persecuting me. And Paul says, no, use the armor of God. That's how to protect yourself. And that's how to, to fight that battle by using the armor of God. You're just, you're just fighting pawns there anyways. I want to tell you, when you use your own power and your own wisdom, your own might, and your own perceived weapons in this battle, from personal experience, you will not be successful. You will lose. You need and must use the armor that God has provided us to get that job done. This armor is given by God for that express purpose for you to win the battle. And it's designed to perfectly um, defeat the enemy. Every weapon that he's given us, everything that he's given us is to defeat the schemes of the devil. And so in Ephesians 6, 14 through 20, we find this armor that God gives us for the battle. The first piece mentioned in, is the belt of truth. If you understand how the Roman soldiers put their armor on, the belt was the, the one item. It was about six inches wide, and it went through some loops and different things. It held their clothing on, and it held their armor in place. The, the sheath for the sword and the, and the breastplate and all of those things, it held it all together so that it didn't fall apart in the, in the battle. Okay, so that belt was very important. It was the foundation of the soldier's armor, much the same as the truth, which Paul says, put on the belt of truth, as the truth does for Christians. You see, D Jesus defeated the, the devil in the wilderness with the truth of Scripture. The devil tried to defeat Jesus with the manipulation of Scripture. But Jesus beat him with the truth of Scripture. So put on that belt of truth. The second piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate was designed to protect from the neck to the thighs all the vital organs in the body. It was a significant piece of protection, and it is just as much a protection for Christians. Um, the breastplate of righteousness, Paul says. You see, the battle we're fighting is evil. When we live a right life in God, it doesn't allow chinks in our armor. It doesn't allow weak spots for the devil to successfully attack us and harm us. And so Paul says, man, put on that breastplate of righteousness. Protect yourself with the righteousness of God. Live that right life. And then the third piece is the footwear. <laughs> it's interesting because losing your footing in a battle is death. It's disastrous. You probably never get back up off the ground. You know what the Romans did? They wore this soft leather sandal and they had spikes on the bottom of it, just like cleats when you're playing sports. Okay, They had spikes on the bottom of their sandals. And so they would dig in and they never lost their footing. <coughs> Think about that. That would be important. For the Christian, the great hope of the gospel 
is our footing. It gives us the confidence to stand firm, unwavering, because it is from God and it is God's promise to us and God's good news to us. So put on the gospel, wear it, and it'll keep you on sure ground. You won't be slipping around and falling. The fourth piece of armor, Paul says, is the shield of faith. The Roman shield was made of interwoven leather. And you think, leather? Yeah, it was made of leather and interwoven to make it strong. But the reason they made it out of leather was because before battle, they would soak their shields because oftentimes the enemy would shoot arrows with fire so that they didn't just hit somebody, but they'd burn what they hit. And so they would get together and they actually connected one to the other together. They could put them together and they made a wall and those arrows came in and they all hit the shields and they were extinguished. Paul says, put on the shield of faith and extinguish the arrows of the devil. That's what he's talking about. So faith is our shield. Faith is what protects us, our faith in Christ. Think about it. He's undefeated. He's not going to get defeated. Our faith in him will leave us undefeated too, even by the devil. So put on your shield of faith. And then the next piece of armor is a helmet of salvation. Obviously, the helmet was designed to protect the soldier's head, the mind. You and I need to protect our mind from the devil because that's what he's after. If he can convince you he's okay, he's got you. If he can convince you there's no God, he's got you. You got to protect your mind. And what protects our mind more than anything else? Salvation. Paul said in Romans 12 verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So put on that helmet of salvation and make sure that your mind and your soul are protected from the devil. Those are the defensive, that's the defensive armor. And then we have an offensive weapon as well. We got to, if we're in a battle, we need an offensive weapon too. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Think about this. The Romans carried, the Roman soldiers carried a two-edged sword, a small one, probably 12 inches long. And they carried that for close in quarters when they battled close in close in quarters. It cut coming and going and was very effective. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and of discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Folks, our weapon is the most effective weapon against the devil. It worked in the wilderness with Jesus, and it'll work with us every time. We have to use it. The only, the only difference, we, the only thing we have to make sure of is that we're using it right. There is nothing more dangerous than a sword in the hand of someone who doesn't know how to use it. And so with the word of God, it is the same. We need to know how to use it. And we look to Jesus for that. And then there's one other piece of armor he gives us. You know, when there's nothing worse or more dangerous for a soldier than to lose radio contact with their leader. They lose radio contact and they're on their own and the enemy is surrounding them. Prayer in the spirit is our radio connection to God, our army leader, our Lord, our master and our savior. Prayer is what keeps us in contact with him and keeps us going, and keeps us in, the, in his strength. Prayer is powerful. It is how we call in airstrikes when we need them, when we're in deep trouble. But it is also how we praise him 
for his might and his power and for getting us out of trouble and for keeping us safe and for providing for us, for providing all of this armor for us. It is our communication with God and it is absolutely necessary in a right relationship with God. Romans 8, 26 says, The Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray, to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The Spirit is on our side. And when we're not praying the right thing, the Spirit says, Father, this is what they really want. This is what they really need. And he helps us get what we need. Isn't that amazing? Even when we don't know how, what to pray for. And I'm sure we've always been, we've all been in that situation. I've been in that situation several times, well, a few, quite a few times where I go, Man, what do I pray for here? And, and, and you know, and I just pray. And I trust that the Spirit helps me in my prayer to get the right prayer to the Father in heaven. Marine recruits were each issued, it, when they came into the Marine, they were each issued with a service bag filled with clothing along with a rifle, a cartridge belt, a bayonet, and a steel helmet. They were also issued some basic supplies for their hygiene needs. This equipment for the Marine is known as their BDU. It is their battle dress utilities. The BDUs were issued to give the Marine um, varying uniforms to be worn in specific situations to give them every advantage in combat and to have them come through that battle safe. That was what that was the purpose of that BDU, that bag. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6 that God had done the exact has done the exact same thing. He has given us our battle dress to engage in combat with our enemy, the devil. And he has given us specific clothing articles for specific purposes to ensure that we are battle ready and that we will come out at the end of the battle victorious with him. You cannot get this clothing anywhere but from God. He supplies it to his saints in the battle for their souls. And it comes with the ultimate guarantee victory in Christ Jesus and the reward of eternal life. You and I are left with, with the need to answer two questions this morning. The first question, have you taken up the whole armor of God? Are you battle ready and prepared in Christ to fend off the flaming arrows of the devil that are shot in your direction? Are you fighting this battle alongside Jesus? The second question I would encourage you at least to give some attention to closely, and it is related to the first, if you have not taken up the whole armor of God, what are you waiting for? Don't you want to be with the one that has already won the battle and guarantees your victory? Why wouldn't you choose the most glorious and wonderful savior over the ill-intentioned devil? That's something I have never understood why people would do that. There's always great news when it comes to Jesus. He is always waiting for you to make the right choice, to turn, to repent, turn back to him, and he will save you from your wretched sinful condition and restore you back to life with him. So if we can help you with that this morning, if you would like to look further into that, we can help you with that in the study of your Bible. Whatever it is that you need help with and you'd like us to help you with, please let us know. And now let's stand and, and sing our praises to God. In heavenly arms.